Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Natural Thought Leadership Series. The topic of our discussion today is future of biotech and the evolving global COVID vaccine landscape. We have a very interesting set of speakers today to take us through this discussion. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to introduce Dr. William A. Hasseltine, PhD. Dr. Hasseltine is a scientist, businessman, philanthropist, and an author. He's an internationally recognized expert on COVID-19 and is often sought after for advice on how to confront the pandemic. He was a professor at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health, and is well known for his pioneering work on cancer, HIV, AIDS, and genomics. He has founded more than a dozen biotechnology companies, including Human Genome Sciences, and seven pharmaceutical products from companies he founded are currently approved by US FDA. He's the author of more than 200 peer reviewed manuscripts and 10 books, including two books on COVID, A Family Guide to COVID, A COVID Back to School Guide, and his autobiography, My Lifelong Fight Against Disease from Polio and AIDS. He's currently the chair and president of the global health think tank, Access Health International. Welcome to the webinar, Dr. Hasselton. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. H. Sudarshan Balal, who is the chairman Manipal Hospital and is the immediate past president of Nat Health. Dr. Balal was the best outgoing student, a blue ribbon awardee of the Kasturba Medical College Manipal, and is a recipient of many gold medals in MBBS and MD. And later on, he furthered his training in the USA and had the distinction of being one of the few to be triple board certified in internal medicine nephrology and critical care. He has the rare distinction of being appointed as professor of medicine with St. Louis University School of Medicine, USA, and is also an adjunct uh, professor of medicine at Manipal University. Dr. Balal was conferred the fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians, London, for its contribution in medicine. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Balal, to this webinar. Ms. Preeta Reddy, uh, is currently the president of Nat Health, and she's the executive vice person at Apollo Hospitals. Ms. Preeta Reddy uh, leads one of Asia's foremost integrated healthcare providers, the Apollo Hospitals Group. She's widely recognized for her contribution in making high quality healthcare accessible to millions across the country. She's known for her support to various entities and industry bodies working for the betterment of India. Apollo Hospitals is acclaimed as the pioneer of private healthcare in India and was India's first corporate hospital. In addition, Ms. Reddy works with the industry bodies and the government of India to advance policy decisions on healthcare. She was the founding member of the Quality Council of India and under her guidance, teams from Apollo worked with the government of India in introducing the NABH accreditation. In 2013, along with Dr. Pratap Siretti, she had championed the establishment of Nat Health, the Healthcare Federation of India, representing the unified and credible voice of the India's healthcare community. She is now the president of Nat Health for the year 2020-21. She is also on the board of governors of the Management Develop Institute, MDI Gurgaon. A warm welcome to you, Ms. Preeta. Now I would like to request Ms. Preeta Reddy to kindly give the opening remarks. Over to you. Preeta. Thank you so much. Welcome and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hasselton, for accepting to be on this program. I understand that we have almost a thousand viewers, so my welcome to all of them too. And I think it's a privilege for us as Indians, as uh, global citizens, to have this opportunity to even hear you. Uh, the past 12 months, the past 10 months significantly has been tumultuous for us uh, as Indians, for humanity at large. And every minute there's an overload of information. And for us uh, who are, you know, literally frontline workers in different ways, uh, Dr. Balal being a very senior, most respected clinician in the country, and me just working with the hospitals, and Siddhartha, of course, bringing together every aspect of healthcare under one umbrella. For us to be able to hear from you what your thoughts are uh, would be really, you know, the next one hour, we're really looking forward to it. I know that genomics as such um, of late has been literally the key word and it has made a huge difference uh, with vaccine, vaccines, for example. I don't think even uh, six months ago or a year ago, 
we could even have imagined that vaccines would really come into being in and you know we could fast track something as significant as that which would make such a great difference and if it wasn't for really uh, being able to adopt and adapt this quickly we may not have been able to do this uh, genomics has played a vast role we all understand that you know you can actually extrapolate the knowledge quicker faster and we don't have to wait that long for solutions in fact um, a very big magnanimous um, person like um, like the owner of uh, microsoft said that what we have done in two months is what could have possibly taken us two decades to achieve so that's what bill gates said and uh, satya nadella said it in a different way so i think we're working all of us at warp speed and the mind is also trying to absorb things at warp speed and sometimes for i think ordinary citizens like us it's a bit hard and that's why we're really looking forward to you telling us what would be the right thing to do and in this space whether it's in the space of innovation whether it's in the space of research whether it's in the space of genomics whether it's in the space of biotech we know that you know we can look forward to many solutions for uh, for healthcare and we really know that we need to have faith we understand that india is a land of uh, astrologers i'm i'm sure you know that astrology plays a large part in our beliefs in our thought process and so on and so forth but if you put science sometimes you know it might seem like a far reaching prediction but it actually comes true so the debate sometimes in my mind is that you know maybe astrology is true too because what the astrologer says happens and what the scientist says happens but the scientist comes with facts with proof with long arduous hours of like really hard work behind computers behind labs behind benches with an army of people working with them so i think we should really give credit to the hours of research and thought which has gone in to producing the kind of drugs the vaccines uh, the predictions of the future because i would put my faith and trust in that so thank you so much uh, dr william hasseltan for your time and i know that the viewership is huge and they're really waiting to hear from you and you cannot have a better moderator than dr balal because every word he speaks is measured and it's words of wisdom so i'm going to turn it over to both of you and really enjoy listening to this healthy and fantastic debate thank you and welcome to india and to the rest of the audience namaste uh, thank you very much preeta for the generous introduction before i get started i have a word about astrology since preeta mentioned that there is a famous astrologer who is a patient of mine and he came to me sometime in june or july when we were at the peak of covid that all of us looked very harassed and he said don't worry doctor it will go away in october i don't know what the scientific basis for that was but uh, lo and behold last week of october there was a dramatic drop almost 80% drop in covid cases in india so be as it may we have a scientist with us so good evening to all of us in india and a very good morning to our esteemed guest from the usa at the outset i would like to congratulate preeta siddhartha and the entire team at nat health on organizing this nat health thought leadership series and a big thank you to the media partner newsex for their support 2020 has been the most devastating year for me in my 50 years of being in the medical field the world has been turned topsy turvy all of us have been bruised and battered by covid and finally it appears that there is some hope at the end of the tunnel with the advent of the vaccine and it is my privilege and honor to welcome our distinguished speaker professor william hasseltine and moderate this session on the evolving global covid vaccine landscape as part of a natal thought leadership series Professor William Hasseltine wears multiple hats is a scientist business philanthropist and author Siddhartha has given a brief introduction i i say it is brief because his true introduction would probably run the entire course of this debate 
So we are fortunate to have him with us, a true brilliant mind in the field of COVID and many other uh, illnesses and viruses uh, that he has dealt with. So what we would like to do in the next 45 to 50 minutes is sort of scratch Professor Hasseltine's brains about some of the thoughts that need clarity in the time of COVID. The first point that I would like to ask him or ask for his comments is a brief overview of the devastation caused by Corona, which of the countries did well in their fight against Corona, and which are the ones that failed. And what do you think, sir, are the reasons for the success and failure of these countries? Over to you, Professor Hasseltine. Well, thank you for, and thanks everybody for their generous uh, introductions and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak on this important topic. An overview of uh, COVID would be hard to give in a few minutes, but I would just say that we know this was a new virus that uh, probably started circulating maybe as early as October of 2019. It uh, became manifest as a, an outbreak in a Chinese city, Wuhan, uh, in a demonstrable way in December, although there's evidence there were a few cases scattered about. <coughs> it caused a, a serious issue. Uh, in that city that uh, wasn't recognized for about uh, three or four weeks. Once it was recognized, uh, the Chinese uh, central authorities um, took uh, very strong measures uh, to control its spread in that city. Uh, what happened in Wuhan was truly devastating for the weeks of uh, January, February, and March. I was in Wuhan in November, probably was circulating by that time, just beginning. Uh, but I was in daily contact with the, my team uh, in China. I have uh, offices of Access Health in China, as well as in India and other countries. And so I had a firsthand view. One of my key people there lost three grandparents in three weeks. To give you an idea of how serious it was. His uncles would stand in line for hours at a time to uh, get medical aid. His family members were infected, and if they weren't infected, they were cowering at home, terrified of what was going on. Um, in a relatively short time, three to four months, that situation was controlled. It was controlled by a very simple process, which is instituting standard public health measures, which is uh, very, it's a, it's a tribute to the Chinese government. They had sent for 10 years people to the Harvard School of Public Health to understand how to control a pandemic. They understood that SARS not only destroyed lives, had the potential to destroy economies. And so they had studied in great detail what to do and they implemented uh, almost a textbook case of what to do. You identify a case, you do contact tracing to understand uh, who was exposed and you quarantine everybody exposed, potentially exposed, whether that was a person, a whole plane load of people has happened to some friends, an apartment building, a city block, an entire city or an entire province. That's what you do, especially in the early days of a pandemic when you have no other tools. Who is sick, who is exposed, control. That worked. It worked in a spectacular way. China is virtually the only country other than a few island nations that instituted that kind of control. And it had to contend with something the island nations didn't have to control, which is a major epidemic in one of their biggest cities. And the city, uh, I would say, is probably equivalent to Hyderabad, but maybe even more kind of a Hyderabad Bangalore. It's a nexus for all their transportation. Uh, it would be equivalent to the US Chicago. Uh, it was a big city and they quarantined 11 million people. That taught the world a lesson which they should have learned, but did not to our great distress, that you can control this virus through public health measures alone without the benefit of all our fancy science. You don't need to do that. The Chinese didn't do that. Now, you could say the telecommunications helped, which it did, and they had their apps, which said you were green, yellow, or uh, red, depending on your, your status, but they didn't even need that, actually. That was a, a bonus. When you look at what happened in the rest of the world, it just didn't happen. We minimized, and I think a continual theme for the world outside of China and a few island nations in Asia is that we minimized the danger of this virus. And to my mind, 
we are still minimizing the danger. Now, let me just take the India situation for a minute. There's some hope that having reached a peak and you see the case numbers decline, that you reached a point where you have population immunity. I have argued from the beginning, that is a poor concept for coronaviruses. You know, as a virologist, you, I've learned over the years to look at nature, not to look at what we think should happen, but what does happen. That's actually surprisingly an unusual situation for most scientists. Most scientists get deep buried into their specialty and don't look up. Really important to look up. When you look up from the coronaviruses, what do you see? Well, the first thing you see is SARS and MERS. That turned out to be a false lesson in one way and a good lesson in another. The false lesson is it just went away. I remember our president saying, oh, don't worry, it's just gonna go away. 15 people are infected and it's just gonna go away. Well, 400,000 deaths later and two and a half million people infected in the United States, it hasn't gone away. The lesson from SARS and MERS where coronaviruses are out there and can adapt to humans and we better be careful. We dropped the ball globally. We didn't do our research on those viruses. We weren't prepared for the next one that came along. Why not? I can tell you, reams of scientists started to work on coronaviruses, got drugs almost ready for the market, got vaccines ready to go, and stopped. Money wasn't there. One thing I can tell you as a scientist, and we know as human beings, without money, you can't do much. And if governments aren't going to give you money and private foundations aren't going to give you money, what can you do? There were a few brave souls who soldiered on. You count them on one hand. That was it for all of coronaviruses after they had scared the wits out of a lot of people. That was the first thing we didn't see. But there was another lesson we should have paid more attention to. Coronaviruses aren't new to us. Every one of you I'm speaking to has a coronavirus infection every year. You call that a common cold. And we get on average about three common colds every year. And one of those on average is a coronavirus. So if you didn't get it last year, you got it the year before. And what we know is they keep coming back and back and back. It's like a bad headache. They just keep coming back like a bad penny, we call it. And it's like the flu. Now, that is the lesson of coronavirus. And I kept warning from the very beginning, don't count on population immunity. I hate the term herd immunity because I don't want to be part of a herd, but population immunity doesn't exist for these viruses, for coronaviruses. People that, oh, well, it will for this one. Well, that's a big underestimate. So the idea that it would go away, this wasn't in the cards and it hasn't gone away and it's gotten much worse. Now, you asked me a very specific question. What distinguishes countries that did well or don't? I have a couple of answers. One's a little bit facile, and that is, if you're afraid for your economy, you took some action. Chinese government and East Asian countries knew that SARS was about to destroy their country, their economy. Now, an economy is different from people's life. It's different from people dying, but it is in some ways even more important because if you don't have an economy, everybody suffers. Every single human in the whole country suffers. Whereas you have a bad pandemic, some people die and some don't. When the economy crashes, you get a depression, everybody suffers. So the Chinese knew that these viruses could crash the economy and they took very rapid action that they'd studied on what to do. And as I say, at Harvard School of Public Health, we helped them learn those lessons. Other countries, Western countries, India didn't have this problem. So they didn't take the same kind of action. That's one answer. Another answer is a deeper answer. Countries, if you're gonna, if this is something for the future, if we're gonna deal with pandemics, we need good political leadership. Some countries had it and some countries didn't. We in the United States did not, Brazil did not, Eastern Europe on the whole did not, Russia did not. And I leave it to you to think whether or not you in India had it. The second is governance. You need a public health system that really works. And a public health system can't work without a health system. 
And it can't work without a health system that's well organized and deals with community health. Because where the rubber gets the road for pandemics is in communities, local villages, townships, small towns and big towns. And if you don't have a health system that can reach right in to those communities, you can't control the pandemic. Cannot be done. That is a fundamental lesson. We in the United States have a very odd system of uh, public health and health systems. We devolve most of our responsibilities to the states and within the states to the towns, et cetera, et cetera. So we have no uniform, had no uniform way of dealing with this. Now, in theory, the federal government could have stepped in and said, we're gonna take over. They chose not to. Now, some European countries had relatively good leadership and did have and do have. And even in those countries, there were other mistakes, which I'll talk about in a second. That's the other thing, you need that. And finally, you need social solidarity. I am my neighbor's keeper. If I don't take care of myself, the neighbor is unlikely to take care of himself and we'll both give each other disease. That is really fundamental. Solidarity, the notion that you are responsible for your health, your family's health and your neighbor's health and they are responsible for your health. That's a message that the whole world needs to learn again and again and again. We are our brother's keepers. They, if they get sick, we'll get sick. And it's true of the whole world. China can control it, this disease within their borders, but they're constantly bombarded by packages that contain COVID on the outside, by people who come in with lingering COVID, and they have to shut down city after city. It's as if one week Hyderabad, it actually reminds me of traveling around India during the monsoons. Uh-oh, Hyderabad is closed for these two days, or Mumbai is closed, or you can't go here or there. It's what's happened, only this is much more serious. It's weeks of isolation and shutting down the whole economy. And no, nobody's isolated on this planet. Thank so, you very much, we, Professor we I think well. you emphasized uh, the role of public health leadership and social responsibility in uh, your yardstick of which countries did well and which didn't. We move on to our uh, next question, that is uh, your views on our path to the early development of Corona vaccine and the role of innovation and technology in the development of the vaccine. You know, I have some different views from most people. I know that. And <laughs> everybody is celebrating how great science is and how we've solved this problem so fast. I would say, yeah, science is great and we haven't solved the problem yet. But that being said, I would argue that we missed the ball in a couple of ways. We didn't need high science. And I say that as a genomicist, and I'm very grateful for the wonderful comments about genomes. In a way, the simplest thing to do was to grow up the virus and kill it like we did with the polio viruses in the 1950s. In fact, some companies are doing that now. The very first vaccine wasn't a high-tech vaccine. It's the Sinovac, the Sinopharm vaccines. It just grew up the vaccine, killed, killed it. And we probably could have had vaccines for many more people much more quickly if we'd taken a simple route, not a complex route. And it may be in the end that those are the vaccines that aren't what I call the Lamborghinis, they're the Toyotas. They're the ones that are go around the world. You need a heat stable, simple to make, possible to make in huge quantities. And we know that these kinds of vaccines work. That's why it worked for polio and still works today for polio. So in a way, our emphasis on high science, rather than the fundamental blocking and tackling that you need to do in healthcare, has led to some problems. The reliance on science, not on public health, has been a disaster for America. We have 4,000 people dead today because we relied on high science, not public health, and more effective science. Same thing goes for diagnostics. We decided we needed PCR diagnostics, very fancy, genomic-based where lateral flow antigen diagnostics to detect people who were infectious would have done far better. And today we still don't have access to tests anywhere like what we need, nor does the world. That was a fundamental mistake made early on that's perpetuated. So yes, it's great that we have these technologies. Now, these vaccines are wonderful that we have them now. We have a variety of them and I'm happy to discuss them in more detail as we go on. 
Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Professor Hasseltain. So your message is very clear, more Toyotas than Lamborghinis. And I think uh, I'll buy a Toyota tomorrow. I was thinking of buying a more expensive car, but I'll stick with the Toyota. I think you also covered uh, my next question, but I would like you to elaborate a little more. You had mentioned that uh, uh, you felt that the testing could have been very different for Corona than the RT-PCR alone. Would you like to elaborate on that? Well, you, you may remember in the early days of detection, the CDC prepared tests that didn't work. They were PCR-based tests. And what could have been done once we understood what this virus was is develop simple uh, antigen tests measuring the concentration of protein in saliva and nasal fluids. Uh, and we would have been able to define those who are contagious. What do you want to do in a pandemic with a diagnosis? You don't want to know somebody's had it. You don't even need to know that they've got a little bit of it. You want to know if they're infectious, if they're contagious. Right. And if they're contagious, you want to do something with that information. So we relied on a test which broke down and has never even to this very day uh, been widely available and is very expensive compared to other things. You can make a simple antigen test that costs 10 cents, a little strip of paper. Somebody can do it in 15 minutes. You don't need a prescription. You just do it like a pregnancy test or some other kind of test. They're very simple to do. Yet almost nowhere in the world do you have free, universal, simple tests that can be self-administered by a parent to their family, by a business, to their workers, to a school, for their children, to know who's likely to be contagious. Now, finding out who's contagious isn't the whole story. It then has to be followed by making sure you can isolate that person. Now, Britain is doing an experiment right now to try to do that. The problem is voluntary isolation doesn't work without economic support. People are avoiding these rapid, simple tests because that means they'll have to stay home from work for two weeks. And who is going to support them? If you've got a good social safety net, yes. But even in London, they don't have a good enough social safety net. So I've actually proposed that if you're going to do those tests, you pay people to stay home. You've got to have a policy, which is a realistic policy. Simple tests, simple solutions, pay people to stay home. Or if you have a good social system, like happens in some European countries, you make sure that that social network functions for everybody. Well, that's a very, very important point. I think uh, we need uh, testing on a mass scale and that has to be less expensive than what it is. And very honestly, this rings a bell. A uh, lot of people didn't want to get tested because they thought the minute they're tested, their house is locked up and they have uh, a family to feed. There's nothing, no income coming. And a lot of people are actually scared to get tested. So we had to literally force them to get tested. So if we had an answer of a social security net to protect these people, maybe more people would have tested and would have known the infectiousness of the illness much earlier. So that's a great uh, take home point. I think even the best of the countries are the most uh, uh, developed countries were not able to provide the social security net and it will probably be very difficult for the developing countries to do that uh, at the current stage. But that's a very important point that you make. Now we come, on the, come to the vaccines per se overview of the types of vaccines and their safety and efficacy and which one would you take if you had a choice of picking one of them well they there are a number of different choices for vaccines um i would take the simplest one which is the killed vaccine for a couple of reasons one it has a huge safety record for vaccines of that sort we know how to make them we know how to use them secondly it's a whole virus is not a piece of the virus. It's the whole virus. So when you get that, you have antibodies, not just to the envelope protein, but to the N protein, the M protein, and a lot of other proteins. And so those are the, that's the reason I would take it because we know when the virus tries to escape, it doesn't just change the envelope, it changes a lot of other pieces too. You can actually see what it's doing. And when you look at what it's doing to escape, you know what the body is doing to repress it. And it's not just the envelope protein. And it's not just the piece of the envelope protein that some of these high-tech companies uh, are developing. Second reason is, the, the let's take the mRNA vaccines where you take a messenger RNA. That's a really unproven technology on a broad scale. 
We don't know manufacturing reliability. We've had some problem now with a California uh, batch of the vaccine, which causes a lot of adverse reactions. We're not getting the full story yet of what the adverse reactions are to those vaccines. Uh, whether you believe the stories from Norway of people dying or many people getting uh, allergic reactions, we don't know about that. Let me say, I don't want anything I'm saying to dissuade people from taking these vaccines. If you have a chance to take the vaccine, take it, okay? Whether or not, the chances you'll get very sick are very small. When you give it to tens of millions of people, the chances somebody will get sick is pretty high. But if you have a chance to take the vaccine, get vaccinated. No matter what else you hear me say, that's the message I want everybody to hear. So everything I'm saying is like a, a variation on that fundamental thing, get vaccinated. Now, the you asked me which one I prefer, that's the one I prefer. After that, I would prefer per subunit vaccines, where you take a piece of the protein, make it a virus, using genetic mechanisms, produce a piece of that virus and use that as the antigen. That's also very well studied. The Indian companies make that by the hundreds of millions. That's the hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, it works extremely well. And uh, we know what the relative side effects of, of those vaccines are. So uh, that's the, there's many other things you could say. Now, there's one vaccine that I think is uh, the one that I think our esteemed uh, colleague here has taken that I would actually not prefer to take. And that's the adenovirus one. And the reason for that, and that's widely available in India, uh, is that it's only usable once. Once you've had that vaccine, you make antibodies, not just to the, the SARS uh, virus you, or the, the COVID virus, you make it to the, the carrier, the adenovirus. And so you can't use it again. So that's one of the reasons I prefer not to have that one. Uh, and I hope I haven't made our uh, interlocutor uncomfortable by saying that. There are other vaccines you could take in addition, so it's not gonna be a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, th thank you. Very strong comments uh, from our scientists. And uh, I think the biggest message was that take the vaccine, whichever one is available for you. Exactly. And I think right now, uh, none of us have a choice, really. The government uh, provides the vaccine and you either take it or you don't. It's very interesting that you talked about the inactivated or the killed virus as probably being one of the better vaccines. There's a lot of controversy there and a lot of people in India, for various reasons, actually think that vaccine is more hazardous than the other vaccine available. So I think it's important to know that uh, that vaccine is safe. And obviously some data on phase three trials are yet to come. But uh, coming from you that this vaccine is safe and probably has the entire virus and it's inactivated and would have the best response is good to know. Thank you very much. And uh, once the private sector or the pr uh, private citizens of this country have a choice, I'm sure they listen to your advice. But till then, we have to take whatever the government gives us. And, and take it where you can. Because sure, that's what I did. <laughs> and uh, the logistics of the production, storage, and distribution across the globe, and your comment on maintaining the extreme cold chain that the mRNA vaccines need. Right. Well, uh, you know, we've known in the global vaccine business for a long time that a cold chain is a problem. Actually, two things are a problem, cold chain and multiple doses. Those are the two things that limit it. And how do we know that? We vaccinated virtually everybody in the world to eliminate smallpox, and it's gone. We vaccinated almost everybody in the world to uh, uh, eliminate polio, and it's not quite gone, but it's almost gone. And in those processes, we've learned the two big barriers to global vaccination. One of them is cold chain, because not everywhere in the world can you maintain a cold chain, especially some of the extraordinary cold chains that are required uh, for this virus, for these, these new vaccines. And secondly, how many doses you need, whether it's now two or some people are even talking about three doses. That's difficult because it's a lot of record keeping. It's asking people with very few resources to come back. And there's a third and actually third or fourth component of vaccines that are important. One is, can you get it to every community? Really important to get it to that last mile in the tiniest village, very important. And to work with community leaders who are trusted, because if you don't have the community trusted leaders to promote the vaccine, there are gonna be people who are afraid to take it. So you need that whole process. And anywhere along that process, you have interruption, like a cold chain, extreme cold chain, uh, multiple doses, 
uh, lack of interdigitation between the central government supplying the vaccine and the local community that's giving it, you're going to have a problem. That last problem is the one we're having right now in the United States. We'll get over it, but we have it right now. No, I think one of the reasons that the mRNA vaccines may never uh, reach or become popular in India is the extreme cold chain, which would be impossible to maintain, and also it's pretty expensive. While we were talking, I saw a right. quick question on, would you recommend vaccination for the children? Maybe a quick answer for that. Uh, the answer is we don't know yet. Right now it's being tested. I certainly hope it will protect the children because some of the new strains that are popping up infect children more than the previous strains. Yeah, the, the reason this question was asked, I'm sure, is in India right now, they do not vaccinate children, pregnancy, and uh, lactating women, rightfully so. So I think we'll have to wait for uh, more data before we start this category of for people to be vaccinated. I know you're very big on mutational viruses. You have spent the, almost half your life on mutations in viruses. The other day, you gave me a number that I've still not been able to calculate uh, how many zeros to add to the 10. <laughs> So the number of mutations that the virus can have. Can you tell us a little more about that? Well, one thing that we had learned recently is going back to the cold coronaviruses. They come back every year, just like flu. And it turns out, much to our surprise, and nobody had really looked, they change just like flu. We should have known that. You know, there's two reasons you can get reinfected every year. One is the immunity drops, and the second is the virus changes. In flu, We've recently learned that immunity drops. We always knew the virus changed. In COVID, we knew immunity dropped, but we didn't know the virus changes, and now we know both things are going on. So natural immunity, you have it for a while, doesn't last very long for these viruses, especially the immunity that may stop transmission, which is called mucosal immunity, that, that type of immunity that stops things from getting into you and from you giving it to somebody else. That doesn't last very long, but the virus changes. And as we start to look, we're seeing that the virus changes. Now, in some ways, the Chinese were lucky. They got the weakest version of this virus. That was what's happening in December and January. By February, it had mutated to become more transmissible, and that spread all over the world, first in Europe, then across the world. And if you have the virus today, that's what you've got. Over this summer and early fall, it changed again all over the world in different ways. You become even more transmissible. So it can get around even better. And I think one of the things we're seeing in these huge surges in the United States and other places is measures that could sort of keep the virus in check last summer aren't keeping it in check anymore because we have new virus variants. There's not just one. And we know that these are escaping our immunity and becoming more infectious. That's kind of worrisome when we think about vaccines. Now, it isn't that we haven't solved that problem. We have with flu, and we sort of solved it. We at least contend with the problem by making new vaccines every year. So another lesson from this virus is think of it as flu. It's a little bit more deadly. So you're gonna to have to make vaccines, not last year's vaccine, this year's vaccine. And the community is just beginning to understand that. And vaccine companies are rushing like mad to try to understand how to deal with it. But it's kind of like pruning a tree. You have a stem, which is the original virus. Then you have branches, you have branches, and you have branches of those. And the vaccine companies are not sure where to look. Well, there's an answer to that problem. Cut down the tree with public health. Don't try to deal with the branches, cut it off at the root. And that takes public health not necessarily the vaccines. That's a lesson that you're gonna hear over and over again in the coming months, but has it been well absorbed at this point by the biomedical community and certainly by our policymakers? It's a lesson that we need to push and push pretty hard if we don't wanna get hit again and again with this very tricky virus. I have a very philosophical question for you. Uh, that is, uh, what about the equitable distribution of the vaccine between the haves and have-nots of the world? That is a very deep question, and it's one that's very important to discuss. Because I think John Donne, an English poet, said it a long time ago, no man is an island entire unto himself. Each man is part of a whole. If a clod be washed away, England is the lesser. 
That's true for our world. We are connected as never before. And that's a lesson for all of these viruses, whether it's the flu virus or the COVID viruses. Starts somewhere in Southern China, gets to Wuhan, spreads around the world, and it's here to stay. Well, if we don't eliminate it everywhere, we're not gonna eliminate it anywhere. That's the lesson. China is learning that every day. It's eliminated internally, but even if it's restricted travel like crazy, it's still coming in. We cannot isolate ourselves from these diseases. We have to be able to help everybody. That's what we learned with smallpox and we did it. That's what we learned with polio and we're doing it. That's what we need to do for this. And India is the country that has the history of supplying those vaccines to the entire world. Why? Heat stable, safe, and cheap. Now, how cheap can a vaccine be? I years ago created a company to make animal vaccines. Now you'd say, oh yeah, there's a lot of animals, 80 billion chickens a year. What's wrong with that? Well, a vaccine for a chicken costs about 0.1 cents, like a rupee, right? That's how much it costs. That's not a very good business. But it does tell you vaccines can be made really, really cheaply, something that most people don't talk about. You know, there's the cheapest price right now I know for the COVID vaccine is a dollar, right? Why not 0.1 cents like a chicken? Could be, it's just that the profit isn't there, but you could still do it if you subsidize it. I think this is a truly, truly a very important uh, message uh, to the entire world because we have become very country specific in the vaccination protocols. And we are not thinking of the world being one. I think unless that's done, we'll have viruses pop up in some country and it will move around the rest of the world in a matter of hours with the current mm -hmm. uh, sort of traveling norms that we have, uh, people travel and the world is one and it's become a really, really small world. I think this is something that uh, you should emphasize, Professor Asseltain, maybe to the UNO, the WHO and whoever else is willing to listen. Because as of now, we, we haven't really emphasized it enough. <laughs> I, have, I do my best. <laughs> you have to. I do my best. I'm, I'm sure uh, with your stage of... We need many voices for this, as you know, to change people's ideas. It's not one voice. It's, all, it's like a chorus. We need many of us. I hope some of the people on this call will join our chorus to say, let's help the world to help ourselves. It's like that man in China. I am willing to restrict my freedom because that means I'm gonna protect others and I hope other people are willing to restrict their freedom in order to protect me. The other question that I'm waiting with the bated breath is when can we breathe easy, literally and figuratively? Uh, well, you know, it's gonna be very spotty in different places. And let's just take again, I go back to China because that's the exception. I have teams of people in China who are traveling, enjoying life pretty much normal with one big exception. They can't get outside the country. Or if they do get out, it's trouble and they have a heck of a long time to get back in. They have to go through a long testing procedure. But life in China is very, very pretty normal. They got back to normal within about five months. Other countries can do that, but don't because they aren't willing to put in the effort to control the pandemic through public health measures. And unless countries are going to do that, I don't see them getting back to normal anytime in the foreseeable future. The vaccine is not going to do it because there'll be variants that come back and start the whole thing over again. This is not a problem that medical medicine alone can solve. Medicine can help shrink that tree, but to cut off out the root, you need to combine it with public health. We need to shrink the tree so it doesn't exist anymore. And when I say it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist on the planet anymore, not just in your country. So I believe we're going to be under, you know, we're going to go through a period, we're entering a period now, what I call vaccine euphoria. We're going to say, okay, it's all over. I'm going to be, and then this time next year, we're going to say, hey, wait, it's coming back. Why the heck is it coming back? Well, flu keeps coming back. Okay, well, we're going to get it this time. So we're going to go through a period of ups and downs in, in, in what we consider normal life. And it isn't until we really squeeze that, cut it off at the root, that we're going to be able to have back to really normal life. And then I hope we've learned a lesson to be vigilant 
There's one other lesson we need to learn from this, which is science has got to pay attention. You can't shove something off into the corner like we did coronaviruses. Nature was nice to us. They warned us not once, they warned us twice. Nature was good. Hey guys, figure this out. Didn't figure it out. So let's not make the mistake again. So I assume from what you've told me that this will be our partners for life. If not life, at least for many more years to come. Yeah, we call it moving from pandemic to endemic. Right. Endemic means it's with us. It's our companion. Something we've got to live with, contend with. And by the way, we do that with many diseases. Think Absolutely. of heart disease, kidney disease. You know better than anybody how many diseases we live with, right? We live with Absolutely. a lot of diseases. It doesn't mean we stop. It just means we have to be more careful. And it means we have to do our best to take the institutions, our leadership, our governance, our social solidarity, and our science, and tune them to their maximum efficiencies. So we can have as close to normal life, what we want to have as normal life. You know, if we look back at my life in the last 50 years, uh, it's longer than that. But if you look back at my life, we've, I've been extremely privileged, except for HIV AIDS and been polio in the early days, to be pretty much free of pandemics and disease. That wasn't life before. Before World War II, that was not life. But remember, even before World War II, people built cities. They built Rome. They built London. They built Paris. They built Beijing. They conducted huge wars. The Japan continents, all with huge disease hanging over their head. Humanity will prevail, but let's hope we prevail and we're happy while we're doing it. Th thank you. And finally, your message to the citizens of our planet. Uh, care for one another. You know, the Bible says, uh, uh, treat your brother as yourself. Take care. You are your brother's keeper. If you take the precautions to protect yourself. You're protecting yourself, your family, and you're protecting everybody around you. And if they do the same, they'll protect you. That is the message, not only on the individual level, but on the country level. Make sure your country is as safe as it could be and disease-free as it could be, and other countries do the same. And then help countries that can't help themselves. Not all countries have the same advantages that India or China or Europe or the United States have. Help those countries too. India is now in a position to help many other countries and it does it. And so we need to join as a community to help our neighbors because in so doing we help ourselves. Well, thank you very much, Professor Hasseltine. Some very, very important messages. The messages being that uh, public health and governance and good leadership is probably the key in sort of cutting down the tree and making sure the sprouts don't come up. And then the important message is that public health measures should continue in spite of the vaccine. Care not just for yourself, but care for the society. It's the world is one and we have to treat it as such. And it's not always science and innovation alone. Simple things first and simple things can conquer this disease. But do not think that disease will just go away. If not a pandemic, epidemic, it will remain as an endemic. And do not shun away from all the masking, distancing, hand washing, and treating the world as one. Thank you very much. I think we may have a few questions from the audience. Siddharth, if they can uh, type in, we may have another five minutes before we sort of conclude. And I would like you to conclude after another five minutes. Please go ahead, Dr. Balal. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any questions from the audience? Uh, I have uh, see one or two questions that come, which I asked for Sassel time. But is there any other questions? They can type in the questions, I guess. There are some of the questions in Q&A section, Dr. Balai. Okay. The bar that you see uh, uh, underneath, you can see some Q&A, uh, some 12 questions. Okay, one second. I am not able to see the questions here. I think one of oh, the yeah. questions... Found it, found it, found it. Yeah. Uh, we'll take as many questions as we can. Will we need a new adjusted vaccine by the end of 2021? I think we could use one right now. Okay, okay. 
The next question is, what is your perspective on building confidence around the vaccines and addressing public reluctance to taking them? Um, I think the message is that it can save your life and it can save your family's life. So you should take the vaccine. And that uh, you have to be clear, there are some side effects to these vaccines, but to the best we can tell, these have been uh, measured very carefully versus their benefit and the side effects are, are quite rare. And as we get more data, uh, we are getting more information about how rare those are. Okay. While vaccines are being administered, what do we all do to avoid COVID infections? Do we continue our focus on testing? Uh, we, first of all, make sure that we're wearing masks, washing our hands and avoiding as much as we can being with people that we don't know. I would advocate one other measure, which most people aren't doing, which is wearing a face shield when you're in public with people you don't know. Because in addition to a mask, a face shield works. The other thing people should know is some of these new variants require more complicated masks. You have to have multi-layered masks because the particles are now so infectious that many fewer, the kind that can get outside of a mask can be infectious. And so you want multi-layers, both to protect yourself and to protect others. And face shields are very cheap. You can keep using them again and again and prevent it from getting into your eyes and curiously prevent it from getting into your uh, nose as well. So it's a good thing to do in addition uh, to a, the other thing I recommend if you're going out in public, uh, wear gloves, disposable gloves and make sure that you change those gloves as frequently as you would wash your hands. Okay, great. Would you recommend screening of neutralizing antibodies instead of binding antibodies to access population immunity or success of the vaccine in clinical trials? That's a complicated question. Um, certainly measuring neutralizing antibodies would be better, but it may not, we don't have tests to measure all the neutralizing antibodies. You know, almost all the neutralizing antibody tests are measured against the receptor binding domain. And it turns out that there are many areas of that uh, virus where neutralizing antibodies work, N protein, M protein, uh, the ORF1, A1B, uh, the, the, the uh, N terminal domain. And so most of the tests are incomplete for neutralization. And those that aren't incomplete are very, very expensive to do. So at this point, I think that uh, measuring antigens and if need be to confirm that with a PCR test is the way to go to, to measure infectivity. Is somebody okay. contagious? There's a question from a close friend and an eminent transplant nephrologist, Dr. Sundar. Can transplant patients who are immunosuppressed take the COVID vaccine? Uh, th that is going to depend upon their doctor's evaluation of their immune status. The thing to worry about with those patients is that they get chronic COVID. So they get the virus and it doesn't leave them. And in that, it's a very, very different kind of treatment regimen that you have to propose for those people. And you have to be very careful because the treatment regimens in those people can lead very rapidly to resistance variants in that person that can then spring out and be transmitted to others. That has happened and probably how most of the resistant variants. So you've got to be, I would say anybody who's got a chronic COVID infection because they're infected and immunosuppressed needs to be taken very seriously as a source of a new global pandemic. And that means isolated very, under very careful conditions. So it, that does not spread out of that patient. I think mean, oh, people are just thinking about that. It's a very important thing for hospital uh, administrators to understand that that one patient could trigger a global pandemic because there are good studies of where patients like that have been treated repeatedly with drugs and convalescent sera, and the virus adapt in that patient. And those adaptations are almost identical, are identical to those that are spreading all over the world today. So treat those patients as time bombs. The next question I assume is someone from the pharma industry. What is the role of pharmacists in the development of vaccine? A pharmacist, that yes. somebody distribute, who distributes the, the drugs, I think maybe yeah. in distributing, yes. 
uh, if you have a good, the, the problem in giving vaccines, especially these newer vaccines, is you have to have somebody on hand who can treat an adverse reaction, like an allergic reaction. And I'm not sure that that can be done in all pharmacies. Uh, in some pharmacies, yes, but EpiPens have to be on hand and somebody who's licensed to use the EpiPen uh, might need to be there. So in the US, we're requiring any vaccine distribution center to have the ability to treat anaphylaxis. And I think that's a good thing. Okay. So I would re- I would think that would be a good figure out the licensing uh, that's necessary for that. The other question is about something in Australia. Comments on the National Sewage Water Survey for COVID-19 study in Australia. Is it worth exploring? It's worth exploring if you're, you know, what, what, what they're talking about is one way to know if there's COVID around or any virus around is to survey the sewage, whether it's a big common sewer or one that comes out of a school building, for example. It's pretty sensitive. Uh, the Israelis have per- perfected it and a few other people have. Uh, it's a good public health measure, but doesn't really tell you, uh, I would say a short answer is in some situations it's worth it. As a general uh, method, I don't think it's worth it. Maybe continual survey of a metropolitan area in several places is worth it to know if there's new viruses coming up. Probably worth it for that, but it's got limited utility. Uh, The next question is from the African continent. Which vaccine will be the best to African countries, considering the weather of the region and storage facilities? Yeah, I think you uh, need a heat-stable vaccine. And I think that the subunit vaccines and the um, killed vaccines are going to be preferable in that circumstance. Okay, thank you. There's one more question whether antimicrobial resistance played a part in this pandemic. Well, if you consider the virus to be uh, a, a microbe, which it is, the answer is definitely yes both in terms of it developing resistance to drugs. I'll give you an example. In, if you give the Lilly antibody to a patient and that patient survives, that person will have a uh, virus population in them that's resistant to that antibody. And some of the variants are resistant to the Regeneron monoclonal antibodies. Two, they use two at once. It mutates uh, in a couple of places. So these viruses have to be thought of as wily and changeable and can, the only way we dealt with that with HIV is to use combinations of drugs. And I think we have to use them at different targets, not everybody targeting the RBD or this or that. There are plenty of targets in this virus. I think there's a huge amount to be learned about these viruses. They're big, they're complex, they're doing many things we just don't know about. And uh, they're vastly understudied for the problems that they've caused. We'll probably take two more questions in view of uh, time constraints. And I think this is from a concerned mother. When will the vaccination of children below 18 commence? I think it's going to come in in stages. The way they usually do it is they do from uh, 16 to uh, 11, and then 11 to 5, and then 5 to 1. And they're doing their best to make sure those trials are done as fast as possible. You don't have to do all the elaborate bells and whistles for first approval, but you do have to do the trials. And those are currently underway for some of the vaccines. And as vaccines will come along, they'll be done for others. But you have to do it for each and every vaccine. And the last question we'll be able to take before I hand over to Siddhartha. Are there any guidelines issued by the WHO to handle and dispose biomedical waste generated during the vaccination? I don't know if it's WHO that does that, but certainly there are each country has biosafety disposal requirements. And uh, that's going to be an issue where you do tests, et cetera. Most of the tests, for example, that are being done, if you're going to swab your nose, come with an inactivation uh, aspect, and you'll need that. Thank you very much, Professor Hasselton. It's indeed been a great pleasure, very informative listening to your experience and your thoughts on uh, COVID and the COVID vaccine. I'll hand it over to Siddhartha. <clears throat> Thank you for a fantastic uh, webinar. Um, I think uh, the key messages, what we take out of this webinar is uh, the genie, uh, for the genie to be put back into the bottle, uh, pure science alone won't do it. And that's a scientist speaking. Uh, it will require the combined efforts of humanity, leadership, a spirit of collaboration, and most importantly, an underlying strong public health infrastructure, which all governments in the world 
have to uh, have to develop. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, lessons out of this webinar. I, I was just reading some of the comments, uh, and uh, I deeply appreciate uh, Dr. William Hasseltine, Bill, for being in this webinar, sharing your thoughts. We hope to get you back again, uh, probably in a few months, and maybe next year again, to see to what extent some of these projections hold good. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bilal, for, for moderating this wonderfully well, and as well as uh, to Ms. Preeta for giving, giving the opening remarks. We really appreciate from Natel's perspective. For those of you who may want to uh, listen to this webinar again, our new our media partner NewsX will be uh, broadcasting it again tomorrow at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Uh, and on behalf of Nat Health and the Thought Leadership Series, we hope to to bring back to you many of these interesting sessions around COVID and the vaccination uh, efforts uh, in short order. With those words, I'd like to thank uh, each and every one of you, the audience. We have joined from all over the world. Thank you to the speakers and have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Siddhartha. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for your time. Thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.